thank you, uh, everybody, for having the stamina to come and uh, continue with us in terms of our DRL events uh, today. Uh, as many of you guys have seen uh, in terms of the work uh, that we've been trying to develop, it's, it's been a very important feature for us to try to come to terms with what terminology such as computation, the issues of analog, the digital, the notions of what an experimental practice and design research and design search actually means uh, today. And through that, I think there's been a sort of active engagement, at least on the design research lab's part, uh, to have multiple voices coming at uh, these kinds of questions which we structure for the students um, as kind of speculative questions over three-year research agendas. The students very much sort of take that on board as a way to sort of proactively kind of engage, tease out, and sort of present in this kind of uh, working laboratory setting uh, kind of alternatives. We try to pursue models that are trying in a certain sense to evolve a kind of discourse. But I think they're privileging this notion of experimentation. And for me, in terms of introducing Philippe, I, Philippe has been a long time friend of the course. He's sat in and been one of the critical voices that we've brought here on many occasions uh, to be a seed, obviously, of a very different kind of approach, but also meaning different with a respect of clarity in terms of a research program that we've always appreciated, and it's a pleasure, I guess, on our part that Philippe has elected to join us, and he will be a new course master running a new studio in the Design Research Lab. And so the introduction to this is actually quite informal from our part, um, because I think Philippe is very much known to many of you uh, what he is elected to do and why we thought it was very important for him to sort of address not only the DRL community, but also position himself uh, respect to a much larger community within the AA and the discourses of, that have been evolving over the years uh, is sort of present a kind of theoretical framework that has been very much a part of how he's been developing the work. I think one of the features that Philippe brings to the course is obviously a disciplined and strong-natured uh, resourcefulness and also a position about looking at mathematics and its application towards computation. He will be speaking, as the title is, on this kind of idea that he has on computationalism. And I think this is a feature that we've been trying to, with all of the other colleagues in the DRL, try to actively interrogate and attack with the idea of really trying to tease out these different positions relative to each other and to start to see uh, what those implications actually mean for design and experimentation. And I'd like for everybody to sort of warmly welcome Philippe to not only this keynote lecture, but to the AA, and allow him for the next hour to sort of discuss his framework with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thanks, Theo, uh, for the introduction and uh, the occasion for uh, lecturing and uh, participating to uh, this uh, amazing uh, teaching experiment, which is the, the DRL, actually. I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, and it's a, it's a great challenge. Um, uh, I'm also proud, in fact, uh, to, uh, to, to teach uh, following uh, achievement by Alisa. So <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, in many, many ways. Uh, so uh, I will... Um, explain you uh, a bit about computationalism, actually, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, I definitely define computationalism not as something which is only related to um, architecture, but let's say a completely global uh, uh, change uh, at the, uh, at which started at the very end of the 20th century. Um, of course, uh, it's definitely related to the advancement of the computer, it's definitely related to what uh, some people call uh, the post-historic man. Uh, by the way, uh, this word was not uh, invented by Francis Fukuyama uh, recently, but it was uh, first uh, mentioned by uh, Roderick Seidenberg. Uh, <coughs> in 1950, and Roderick uh, Seidenberg, by the way, was trained as an architect. 
which is uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, 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 thing to, to know. This computationalism is definitely related to uh, the data. I mean, not data as something which is uh, just part uh, of the world, but something which is definitely building a completely new world in itself, uh, or, or let's say in themselves, actually. Since the amount of data is, is amazingly increasing, uh, last year we produced more knowledge uh, in, uh, in the form of data that, that all the pre previous knowledge in history of the world, uh, which is just an amazing uh, fact when you, when, when you think of it. Computationalism I is different to, uh, let's say, uh, digital architecture or some of the other uh, pre, uh, let's say, preliminary movement in architectural theory in the sense that it's related to information, but it's related to information as a potential uh, uh, computation. I mean, it's not just that everything is information, it's, al it's also the fact that everything is information. And this is definitely uh, uh, um, what is uh, related, uh, what is mentioned by uh, <coughs> Stephen Wolfram, especially with the Wolfram Alpha, which is defined as a computational knowledge engine. So for example, I just wanted to know uh, how many days uh, uh, um, uh, um, separated uh, uh, the previous, uh, I mean, the present lecture to one I, I gave to the AA on November, November 10, 2008, and I just asked to uh, Wolfram Alpha number of days from today to November 10, 2008. It interprets it in a much smarter way, and it just tells me that it's 1,164 days, three years, two months, eight days, uh, or, <coughs> or 832 weekdays, et cetera, et cetera. This is really uh, uh, what is the difference between, let's say, computational knowledge and, and standard knowledge. But on the other side, ultimately, uh, I define computationalism uh, as a, let's say, as a social discourse. I don't define it as something which has to deal with the form or such or such architecture. Uh, I have to say I'm not completely uh, interested uh, into that. Uh, as you will see, I'm mainly interested in the relation between a, a, a present state of knowledge and, and uh, what kind of, of uh, universal and cheap architecture we can attain, actually. Uh, that's what I, I, I will present. Uh, and computationalism is definitely related to uh, this idea of, uh, of, of this uh, Rousseau uh, question, actually, uh, in the 18th century. Uh, does the establishment of uh, advanced sciences and art contribute to the advancement of uh, the quality of human life, actually? Uh, and I hope that uh, my proposal for this advancement of the quality of human life uh, uh, will be uh, uh, considered. Uh, there might be uh, considered a bit polemic uh, as well. Um, so computationalism is related to the end of rationalism. Um, I don't consider that computation can be related to rationalism because the state of knowledge uh, from the very beginning of rationalism during the Renaissance, which is uh, expressed here with the uh, 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 Padova Theater, anatomical theater in Italy in 1940, uh, sorry, in, 19, in 1594, sorry. Um, is something which, uh, which is ended up at the moment. Rationalism was very much related to a certain state of knowledge, also to a certain state of art, especially embedded in modern art. Uh, this uh, rationalism was from time to time crit criticized uh, here by Jackson Pollock, who found this rationalist uh, uh, modern uh, art far too uh, uh, objective with a, with a very uh, lack of subjectivity, and it was something which was uh, going against life itself. And on the right, we see that uh, uh, this critic of rationalism was itself criticized uh, by the pop artist. In fact, very few artists addressed uh, the, the, let's say, um, 
the advent uh, of the information uh, right after the Second World War, which uh, according to me was the main uh, phenomenon, the main radical phenomenon. Uh, one of these artists wa was Mel Buckner uh, in uh, 1966, who the first uh, address the issue of reproductibility of uh, information. On the right, uh, this is uh, an exhibition uh, that he organized as a very young teacher, which is called uh, Walking Drawings and Other Visible Things on Paper, not necessarily meant to be viewed as art. Uh, and as you can see, uh, yeah, the title of this exhibition is uh, quite <laughs> Uh, cryptic, actually, uh, uh, and the four uh, folders here on the right uh, are making use for the very first time of the Xerox copy machine. So all of the pieces of art which are presented in the exhibition are not pieces of art in the traditional sense. They are just Xerox copies of drawings which were sent by mathematicians, physicists, scientists, and artists as well. Uh, right after this, um, some people also uh, started to think about uh, the problem of language. Uh, they started to consider that uh, rationalism was related to uh, language, and in a sense, if rationalism was uh, uh, imprisoning us, it was because the language of rationalism was in itself a prison, actually. This was uh, clearly stated by uh, Frederick Jameson in this famous book, which is a, a, a critical account of structuralism and Russian formalism. But in fact, what uh, was addressed by many of these thinkers uh, was, uh, let's say, the advancement and the evolution of rationalism, but something was lacking. And what was lacking, according to me, was a clear attention to the most amazing and radical uh, uh, changes uh, and scientific revolution in the field of mathematics and, and logics as well, which is the uh, advent of a universal idea of everything, let's say. Um, so Leibniz worked uh, on this universal character, Georges Boulle worked on, on the universal algebra, and finally Turing demonstrated that a universal machine could just compute everything. So this idea of universalism is very important to me since this is what I'm trying to, um, let's say, to, to, to find or to develop into the field of architecture. This universalism allowed actually to transform everything into a mechanical uh, uh, thing, uh, as you can see here, uh, with the work of Franz Rollo. And later on, uh, at the mid-90s, uh, 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 actually, John von Neumann, let's say, uh, uh, wrote the final words on rationalism because John von Neumann demonstrated that uh, the digital machine was intrinsically more powerful than any other analogical machine, which is a very important statement. Because of this statement, in fact, everything became computation, I mean, computational, com sorry, can be computed. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, it signified the very end of the old mechanical paradigm, which was the paradigm of the rationalist period. Uh, and this end was uh, uh, expressed in a famous exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1968, uh, organized by Pontus Hulten, which was uh, the machine or the art of at the end of the mechanical age, actually. And this uh, end of the mechanical age can be clearly uh, seen in the failure of uh, the very last model of a uh, typing machine, here one which is produced by Olivetti, actually. Uh, because mechanic, I mean, a machine, the, 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 let's say the idea of a machine is the fact that it's reliable. It's the fact that you can do something a certain amount of time and that you can repeat it as much as you can. And by the way, uh, with this machine, the very idea of the machine collapsed because it was so complex, mechanically speaking, that you just, it was not reliable anymore and you couldn't repair it as well, actually. So in fact, uh, 
right after uh, 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 the demonstration by von Neumann that uh, uh, the digital uh, uh, was intrinsically uh, better than the analogic, actually, uh, we had, let's say, an empirical proof of that by the very failure of all mechanical machines and paradigm. So uh, I express this uh, computationalism which is replacing 400 years of rationalism, of Western rationalism through this diagram because the old disciplines, and most of them were invented uh, actually during the 18th century, uh, like biology was uh, uh, the first time that the word biology was used was at the very beginning of the 19th century uh, by Lamarck actually. Uh, and in fact, all those disciplines are now moving into computational something. So it's computational biology, chemistry, economics, etc., etc. And everything because be becomes a matter of logic and everything becomes a matter of computing. So in fact, there's not just one logic like during uh, the rationalist period, actually, uh, which was first based on the uh, Aristotelian syllogistic, and then uh, it, it was uh, reinvented by Georges Bull and Got Gottlob Frege in Germany. Uh, but we see now that we have an amazing amount of logic, and we also have an amazing amount of uh, computing paradigms. So uh, I define this rationalism, uh, this computationalism, uh, uh, as something which which has uh, its, uh, let's say, roots at the uh, mid uh, um, 20th century, uh, and which is becoming very obvious uh, now to all of us. On another level, on a completely visual level, I would say that uh, uh, rationalism started uh, during the, at the Renaissance and it ended up at the very end of the uh, 20th century with that kind of geometry uh, which is uh, still done by human and not completely done by computer because it's still a matter of, let's say, uh, a matter of playing with a mouse uh, uh, and playing with shape, actually, which uh, computationalism it's ab is absolutely not about. In architecture, uh, one of the last attempts uh, to address or to reintroduce an idea of rationalism uh, was Peter Eisenman. Uh, but uh, definitely it was an amazingly interesting uh, architect uh, and, and attempt, but this attempt uh, failed. Uh, it didn't fail because Eisenman uh, was not a good architect. I mean, I just uh, believe that is the most amazing and, and um, an amazing genius in architecture and probably one of my favorite, by the way. Uh, it just failed because uh, rationalism is impossible it's intrinsically impossible. And some other architects expressed that in a different way. Andrea Bronzi expressed also the fact that everything was becoming liquid. And this drawing at the end of the 60s, actually, which is called Structures in Liquefaction. And on another level, this, this collapse, this uh, uh, collapse of rationalism was uh, very clear here uh, in the Prit Igo demolition uh, in uh, 1972. Uh, let's say why? Because probably on a political level, uh, the rationalist uh, period was also based on a very strange idea of what the world should be. I mean, it was a world of domination, it was a, a colonial uh, attitude regarding uh, the expansion of the Western civilization. Uh, here, an advertisement uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century uh, for the uh, British colonial empire, actually, uh, uh, trying to engage the English uh, people to love uh, the British empire uh, as much uh, as they can, actually. Uh, but uh, it's clear that uh, maybe we loved some uh, people uh, abroad, let's say, uh, but uh, with the 9-11, uh, 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 we had a clear demonstration that it was maybe not uh, completely, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, mutual. <laughs> uh, 
Another, uh, another clear aspect, another clear aspect of uh, computationalism uh, is the computational logic of uh, the economy uh, that we uh, know at the moment. Uh, yeah, as you can uh, clearly uh, easily see here, yeah, I'm referring to Frederick Jameson, who wrote uh, this amazing book in '73, which is the cultural logic of late capitalism. Uh, actually, no, it's not in in '73. Sorry, it's uh, in the '80s, at the end of the '80s, um, and in fact, uh, I'm also trying to capture. Uh, the computational logic of late capitalism. So this computational logic is based on an amazing transformation of the nature of the work. It's based on uh, what I call an integration, uh, a, a convergence of, of many dimensions of the economy, and all that is made possible by the computer, actually. If we can do nanotechnologies, it's just because of the computer. On a theoretical level, we cannot address the issue or even the concept of nanotechnology with machines that would be analog, actually. It's not possible, it's not theoretically and mathematically possible because of a lack of precision. It's only possible thanks to the computer. And those nanotechnologies are uh, merging many disciplines at once. Every day you have hundreds and hundreds of new chemical components which are invented. So uh, here is a spray, uh, by the way, it's a spray uh, uh, clause which uh, is developed uh, uh, here in uh, the London University. Uh, and uh, at, the, um, at the turn of the Second World War, uh, we know the, uh, um, the advent of those uh, milling machines which were uh, first developed for the uh, um, um, US uh, military industry, uh, the first Unimate robot, now we know this autonomous welding, this autonomous oil truck. And in fact, uh, the old economy, which was still very much related, let's say, to rationalism and to the net networking of human intelligence, this was theorized at the end of the 90s by people working in the field of, let's say, the multitude movement. Uh, but I, I, I strongly believe that uh, it's not radical enough because it doesn't address uh, the real issue, and the real issue is the fact that the computational economy is based on the networking of machine intelligence. It means that everything becoming is becoming a matter of autonomy and computers of computers and personal factories. Um, that is my, I mean, this is the way I define myself, the project of autonomy. Uh, so uh, uh, I like to uh, enter into a debate with uh, Pierre Vittorio, uh, actually, uh, about uh, this, uh, <laughs> uh, let's say, extreme uh, uh, scientific scenario of autonomy. And this autonomy is uh, well uh, um, uh, uh, expressed also by the advent of new technologies like new personal supercomputers, which uh, have the computing power of a small cluster at one to one hundredth uh, of the price, actually. Uh, and uh, these computers, and I'm more or less sure, and uh, I hope the student will make use of it uh, within the DRL, uh, I, I'm more or less sure that these uh, personal supercomputers uh, will be uh, uh, very interesting uh, in the field of architecture. Um, I'm still think, uh, and this is a, a, a small uh, uh, interpretation of um, um, a comment by uh, André Breton saying that uh, surrealism is the communism of genius. And in fact, communism of genius is maybe not so much about surrealism, but it's maybe much more about computation, since uh, everything is available to everybody for a very cheap price. Uh, we will address this is issue of price uh, uh, later on. So, in fact, there's no future uh, concerning work. I mean, we have robot army, which uh, lead to manufacturing revolution. Uh, jobs are definitely obsolete uh, uh, on any uh, uh, level, let's say. Uh, so we have to think about the way we are dealing with that. And I believe that uh, the architecture also has to address this. I mean, to address this as a very powerful, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, motto. Um, Guy Debord wrote uh, in uh, 1956, 
uh, this in Paris uh, in the Rue des Beaux-Arts, which is uh, never work, actually. Uh, some architects address this a bit later, like Anseline. And actually, it's very amazing to see how uh, Anseline vision is now uh, uh, becoming amazingly banal, actually. But this change is so radical that it almost brings, in fact, a new, let's say, a new theology. I mean, it's not just a matter of a, a, a local social transformation. It's really a completely new theology in itself. And it completely changed also the idea of the architecture we are dealing with. Because we are, we are producing architecture which in many cases is more and more, let's say, uh, uh, physical, more and more present. We are producing skyscraper. We are producing an amazing amount of, of stuff. Let's call it like that. Uh, while we all know that we could perfectly deal with that kind of carpet-based architecture, because it seems to me that now uh, uh, architecture is just a matter of carpet uh, and computer, exactly like in religion, actually. I mean, you just put a carpet on the, on the ground and you have a mosque. And in fact, every time we, we go back to this idea of work, it seems to us that there's no way to address this idea of work unless uh, 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 in a very, very, uh, 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 let's say, feudal way. I mean, it's not work anymore. It's just a matter of slavery. And this is something which is becoming more and more obvious uh, in many, many countries, actually, here in uh, Haiti. Another aspect of this computational logic of late capitalism is the rise of finance, uh, the rise of the robot market. Uh, we know that all finance now is addressed through automated uh, method. This was perfectly envisioned by Marshall McLuhan, actually, uh, who said that the computer is the LSD of the business world. And this was also addressed uh, in 1931 by uh, Thomas Watson, uh, who was uh, the creator of IBM, uh, uh, the International Business Machine Corporation. Uh, who said that in the future only speed would be important in business and actually the contemporary finance industry is giving uh, 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 to this uh, uh, prediction uh, uh, an amazingly uh, 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 valid empirical proof actually. So we are doing uh, business uh, uh, with an increasing uh, 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 speed, speedness actually. We are doing this, uh, we are now dedicating uh, uh, hardware only to uh, nanosecond trading. Uh, we are trying to overcome uh, the intrinsic limitation of, of the computation. Uh, it opens the path to what is called hypercomputation. Hypercomputation is something which is related to, let's, let's do it like that, I mean it's trying to make computation faster than the speed of light, actually, trying to overcome the speed of light. But on a more, uh, uh, on a more practical level, on the level of architecture and, uh, and, and urbanism, actually, it has very deep consequences. It has deep consequences because, for example, in 2010, two researchers at MIT and Harvard uh, proposed an interesting scenario about what would be the most interesting places in the world in order to trade and to do uh, uh, finance and stock exchange. It, le it led to uh, this map, uh, uh, with, with which is really a, a, a completely new image of the world. I mean, exactly like uh, during the Renaissance, uh, when the cities of Genoa in Italy, Firenze, uh, and Amsterdam and Antwerpen actually uh, uh, emerge. Uh, which, I mean, cities which were based on a completely new kind of capitalism. Uh, now it's not only four or five cities in the world, uh, but it's really like an endless amount of dots in the world which are just trying to exploit geography uh, uh, and quantum physics on a, very, on a very interesting level. In fact, we all know that place is important, which was not uh, 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 the case in the, uh, let's say, in in the 90s uh, uh, social theory, because in the 90s social theory, we thought that because of the computer, we thought that uh, uh, places wouldn't be important anymore. 
actually, because computing power uh, information would be available everywhere. In fact, it's true and not true at the same time. I mean, on a pure level of information, it's true, but as soon as information in itself and the speed and the, the quality of the access to the information is becoming a very important characteristic, then it's not true anymore. And in fact, for example, for this uh, new project of a parallel, uh, 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 um, um, sorry, I lost the word in English, uh, a telescope, actually, a radio, radio uh, a telescope in Australia. Uh, in fact, we know that the place is important because it was the only place where it could be installed because of a complete lack of noise, actually. And uh, as it was uh, presented uh, uh, very, very recently, uh, uh, as you can see, it was published uh, in uh, January, I mean this comment, but the book is very recent. Uh, as one researcher uh, mentioned, uh, and I read it, as Milanovic uh, notes, an, ast an astounding 60% of a person's income is determined merely by where she was born, and an additional 20% is the dictated by how rich our parents were. He also makes interesting international comparison. The typical person in the top 5% of the Indian population, for example, makes the same as or less than the typical person in the bottom 5% of the American population. That's right, America's poor, poorest are on average richer than India's richest which is well uh, uh, expressed uh, in this uh, diagram, uh, uh, in actually. So in fact, uh, I'm trying to address this, uh, I mean, through the idea of a new landscape. What would be the new landscape of the computational era, in a sense? Uh, could we have extreme, let's say, extreme scenarios? And I completely believe that we can have some of these scenarios, at least as a very critical tool an, uh, uh, an instrument to address the evolution of the, uh, of the world, actually. Uh, so I'm going back to this uh, Renaissance period because I, I, I much believe that uh, it was so radical that the only way to understand what is happening at the moment is to go back to, to uh, uh, the same kind of radicality in, in the political uh, and economical change, actually. And I start to define the world as just one very gigantic uh, ocean, exactly like Buckminster Fuller, and uh, by the way, I'm both fascinated by Buckminster Fuller and by Ludwig Wittgenstein, so uh, I like the idea that both uh, like both, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, and this idea, uh, uh, this image of the, of the ocean uh, is very present in my uh, scenario for uh, uh, computational urbanism, let's say. Uh, this is a recent patent uh, by Google uh, for a server, which is uh, a boat actually, which is floating and which doesn't consume any kind of energy. It's a very basic but just amazingly beautiful uh, drawing. And uh, when you go back to this uh, Constantinos Doxiadis uh, drawing, for example, in uh, 1968, uh, you see that uh, architects are uh, especially at the moment, lacking a, 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 a deep and global vision uh, of the world which is related to, to, to the advancement of techniques and technology. Uh, some of the architects uh, in the 60s uh, addressed that, and we all know those very famous drawings, but what we can see is that in the very recent time, uh, this oceanic idea of architecture is appearing, uh, mainly, re mainly in relation to, uh, let's say, hardcore capitalism, actually. But we don't address this on a theoretical level as architect, which is probably uh, a, a mistake, in a sense. We don't address this idea, for example, of amazingly beautiful linear city in Key Largo, uh, in Florida, uh, actually. We don't address this idea of, let's say, amazing landscape, uh, which, which mix up uh, uh, housing and beaches and, and nature and ocean, uh, which I believe uh, uh, is, yeah, let's call it like that, a pity, because uh, I'm completely convinced uh, that uh, we know, I mean, that we have alternative way of thinking about architecture. By the way, 
when you uh, 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 do that, you go back to different uh, people. You go back to Guy Debord, uh, which remained for me, uh, let's say, the smartest uh, theoretician in the 20th century, when Guy Debord, uh, uh, addressed and set up the, the problem of the drifting, saying that the problems so associated with drifting are those of freedom. Everything leads us to believe that the future will plunge the behavior and decor of today's society into ir irreversible change. One day we will build cities for drifting, which was well expressed by some of the projects we have seen today, by the way, which is interesting. So uh, we have to think uh, of the world uh, on a different level. And this idea of a derive uh, was also addressed by Turing himself as an image. Turing uh, 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 spoke about a computational de derive, actually, a computational derived. And, and, and he referred to that when, when he, he considered the relation between computation and biological phenomenon, mainly related to reaction diffusion. And some uh, uh, other artists here, uh, uh, André Breton, actually, started to draw their own map, actually. Um, and uh, this is uh, the world through the surrealist uh, eyes uh, by André Breton. But the funny thing is that, in a sense, it's very related to the kind of, of idea of the world that we can see today. I mean, a world which is completely stretched and dismantled. So what would be... Uh, uh, the future of the world uh, on an, let's say, what would be the very basic definition of a computational urbanism. So first, I, I think it's about drifting, it's about a growing uh, world, everybody should just build its own island and go uh, on the sea. Uh, so uh, the classical categories of architecture, I just believe they don't, they, they, I mean, they don't fit anymore and they are not going to fit in any case. It's over, let's say, forever. Um, and uh, in fact, we, we, we can think of uh, this world as something which is completely uh, porous, which is uh, completely uh, uh, scrambled in a way. But what does this imply? Two things. Uh, first, and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy that Patrick is here, of course. Um, I think that uh, it's a very uh, uh, scientific view of the world. I don't consider computationalism, of course I'm saying that it's, that, that it's also a social theory, but it's not a social theory which is based on social discourse. It's a social theory which is based on a pure and absolute use of science, nothing else, and I will show what, what, what it means to me, actually. So that's why I believe that we should discuss all isms, uh, that are not scientific, uh, except computationalism, because it's based on science. <laughs> um, computationalism is about real democracy that logically leads to the absence of politic. Uh, the, this idea of a real democracy, which logically leads to the absence of politic, is not new, actually. It's, uh, you can find this already in the writing of Rousseau. You can find this in the writing of Gracchus, Babeuf, which is considered by Marx as the very first communist in history. And of course, you can find it in the work of Marx itself, himself. And to quote Marx, computationalism would be today uh, the computational management of things. Um, and some Marxist architect like Hannes Meyer addressed that. So Hannes Meyer that said that the goal of the architecture is not to embellish life, it's to organize it. So, if we agree with that, actually, if computationalism is the management of things, how things are organized? Um, I believe that things should be organized in a very objective manner, and that wa that's uh, what was proposed, uh, uh, that's why he was considered as the very first communist, uh, uh, and not an utopian communist, but a realist uh, one, actually. Uh, a scientific uh, uh, communist by Marx. Uh, Gracchus Babeuf, uh, in uh, 1789, uh, same year as uh, the French Revolution, uh, proposed this idea of the cadastre perpetuel, which is a perpetual, perpetual land survey, actually, uh, a, a perpetual uh, um, a registry. And in fact, uh, in the proposal of uh, uh, Gracchus Babeuf, uh, we started with property, and then you start to divide it. 
into some sort of a recursive and endless uh, uh, process of division of the land, uh, and you just distribute pieces of land to each person at each new generation, actually. At each new generation, you just re you just readdress the issue of land on a global level, and if you do that, it would mean that each person on Earth at the moment, actually, uh, with seven billions of inhabitants, would at least have 10,000 square meter for uh, himself, which I believe is a very uh, interesting answer to the supposedly uh, over uh, to the supposed overpopulation, which is a complete lie, actually. It doesn't exist and it's not going to exist, never. Uh, 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 maybe if we would be 40 billion of people, but actually it's never going to happen. So in order, uh, uh, as a parallel to Gracchus Babov, who based, who based this political and, uh, 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 let's say, polemical proposal on the new use of new mathematical instrument for measuring Earth, actually, in his time. Uh, and this uh, mathematical instrument was uh, developed, developed by uh, somebody which who was called Mr. Audifray, uh, which invented the graphometre trigonometric, actually, uh, which was a new uh, interesting uh, method in order to uh, address scientifically uh, the issue of measuring the land. Uh, I believe that today we can do that in a very uh, uh, interesting manner. But if we want to address this in a very equalistic or equal way, uh, what, do, what do we need? I mean, how can we be sure that science in itself will be objective enough, actually? How can we be sure that it won't be distorted? We know that in a computer, for example, there's no real uh, random number. All the numbers in the computer are, are pseudo-random numbers. They are not true random numbers. So, in fact, we can use today those uh, quantum random number generators, which are giving us a completely objective uh, random numbers which are based on the physical laws of nature, so it's as random as the fact that we are born or not born, actually, which is a very interesting uh, uh, idea, I believe. Uh, and uh, when we use that, uh, here on the right, these numbers are generated uh, by a website, and I just show it to you uh, now, in real time, actually, by a website uh, which is called random.org, uh, which is providing you uh, very amazing sequences of, oh, sorry. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I use not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so which is a, a providing series of uh, absolute, absolute quantic random numbers. Uh, and uh, uh, you can get, of course, all these numbers for uh, anything. And uh, according to my scenario, for example, when you are born, uh, a machine, maybe Google, uh, will just tell you when you are going to live, actually. So you just pick geographical coordinate in a quantum way. So you are just absolutely sure that the place that, I mean, you will locate on Earth would be as random as the fact that you have such or such parents, would be as random as the fact that uh, you have long hair, short, that you are tall or short, etc., etc. I mean, I believe that uh, computationalism should be about inserting, in a sense, a new state of nature which uh, is politically uh, uh, puzzling, I mean, engaging. So that's why, that's why uh, uh, I, and of course the, the idea of nationality, the idea of religion, I mean, all that is not addressed. I mean, you just choose what you want to do, where you want to live, but in fact, your life is just starting from pure quantic randomness. But I mean, in any case, life is starting as a pure random process. So why not addressing this idea uh, as a political uh, discourse, actually. And as you can see on the left, uh, pseudo-random uh, numbers coming from a computer, they create that kind of repetitive pattern which uh, 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 states the fact that it's not random uh, at all. I don't know if you see the fringes on the screen, but on my, uh, uh, you can see it. 
So we should address uh, this division of land through completely computational methods, giving uh, birth uh, to uh, new scenarios, new earth, new uh, 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 urbanism, with a completely different approach uh, to the idea of the city and to uh, the idea uh, uh, of, let's say, geography as well. So let's come back to uh, now the idea of architecture. What would be the architecture of computationalism, actually, if we address the idea of something which is just completely generic, which is universal, which is based on science, and which, which is a, a, a scientific-based uh, or a science-based science political discourse which is addressing uh, the idea, of, uh, I mean, the deep transformation of the world on an economical level. One of uh, uh, my interests uh, uh, and my, my former interest, let's say, uh, was mainly uh, when I was a student, and this was, uh, 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 this was my, my uh, um, graduation diploma. Uh, when I was a student, my main interest was in mathematics, but it was in mathematics, uh, the, let's say, the mathematics of continuity. I mean, I was interested in, let's say, Bézier curve, Bézier surface, etc., etc. I was interested in curvature, as well, so uh, let me come to this idea of this investigation of curvature. Uh, I don't know where it is, actually. Yeah, it's here. It's start here. Yeah, this is about, I mean, characteristic of flying tangent vectors, tangent surface, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's a, and then I came, I came to this idea of curvature, which is, which is that, I mean. Uh, but in fact, uh, what I can see uh, uh, at the moment, uh, after, after, let's say, uh, um, almost 10 years uh, or eight compared to the, that work that I, that I presented as my graduation uh, thesis, uh, compared to that, I started, I st I mean, I became, let's say, more and more um, skeptical about the way we address the relationship between what is uh, made possible thanks to the computer and how do we build architecture. Because in fact, we are speaking about smooth shape, we are speaking about continuity, we are speaking about something which in itself remained quite a classical way of addressing the idea of architecture because it was the way it was addressed by the modernist architect. Uh, so, but when we take a look at very different architectural culture, we see that even the idea of a continuous surface, for example, in this architecture doesn't really exist in a sense. I mean, we see things with completely different, different eyes. And it's the same when we take a look at vernacular architecture as well. I mean, everything is made of very elementary element. And what I'm interested uh, 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 in with these two examples, it's not only the fact that it's, let's say, different than the contemporary architecture which deal with smoothness, with curvature, with continuity, with deformation, etc. But it's also the fact that uh, it gives a different relationship with the idea of knowledge and with the idea of geometry. And also it gives a different relationship with, uh, let's say, what means an architecture that is, let's say, simple or complex, or what, I mean, what, what does it mean? And in fact, what I'm interested in when I take a look at this example, for example, it's the fact that the architecture on a geometrical level is more or less always made with one element, which is geometrically uh, uh, fuzzy, it's not well defined, actually. But also I'm interested in the fact that it costs nothing. I mean, in a sense, the cost of this architecture can just be reduced to the cost of the stone. And the cost of the stone, as we all know, in a sense, at least to a certain extent, is just nothing. I mean, it has no cost at all. I'm interested in that not only because of this picture, but because one of the scenarios for the future of computation, which was uh, 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 proposed by Ray Kurzweil in his book, The Singularity is Near, uh, 
is the fact that computation in itself ultimately with, will also become as cheap as a stone. And Ray Kurzweil is just precisely, in a very precise way, saying that in fact in a stone you have molecules and atoms. They are organized, I mean, they are moving in a non-organized way, but, but if we manage to organize them, of if we manage to understand the kind of information they can provide, then a computational process can be seen into a stone, and then computation is as cheap as a stone. So it means that it has no price, in fact. And I'm interested in this idea of architecture that would have, let's say, no price, uh, which, uh, which doesn't deal with most of the uh, 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 actual ideas of architecture, let's say, if it's performative, uh, if it's very stable and all that. I mean, for me, all these questions are solved. We know that we can do that. I mean, computer can compute anything. It's theoretically proven. So there's no reason for not being able to compute the performativity of an architecture. It's just a matter of, uh, okay, it's practical. It's not a theoretical discourse. So let's do it and let's stop speaking about it. So, but on the level of architecture, if we, if we are in search of an architecture which has no price, what does it mean? I believe that it's, it's very much related to the intrinsic geometry of such an architecture. And this intrinsic geometry is related to the way we build it. Here uh, in the year 30s, it's a, uh, it's a carpet done by Sophie Tober Arp, and we see we see the discrete, the discrete grid on the left, which is definitely related to the fact that, it, that it's a carpet. So you have a really clear relationship between the nature of the work, the carpet, and the nature of the drawing, let's say the nature of the geometry of the drawing. And I think this is something which was addressed also by Nicolas Negroponte, actually, uh, uh, <coughs> in 19, 1970, but it was not addressed on a local scale, it was more global, uh, a bit like uh, uh, the Japanese architects of the metabolist movement. It was more a matter of capsule, but it was not really a matter of a small constructi constructive element which is very, very small and which is available on a very local scale. And this idea, this idea of something which is reduced to uh, uh, an elementary element, which is a voxel, uh, uh, by analogy with the pixel, which, which means picture element, so voxel just means volume element or volumetric element, actually. Uh, we addressed that uh, in this project in 2004, which is entirely computational. I mean, we didn't uh, 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 do anything uh, uh, into that, which is a series of chair. It was computed by 12 computer, by a cluster of 12 computer, it was, I, uh, I mean, one of the first application of, of, of grid computing in, in architecture, but even if it's a very small grid, of course, because it was only 12 computers. So, in fact, I'm moving from this work uh, uh, I, uh, I've done in 2003 and 2004, which was uh, called Empiricism and Objectivity, Architectural in investigation with Mathematica, which was related to continuity, into something which is more related to this idea of an elementary volumetric element. So a couple of years ago, I mean two years ago, we uh, invested in a robot in order to deal uh, uh, with that, and uh, as we can see, uh, I mean uh, my office is here in uh, Paris, actually. Uh, so uh, we have a small uh, industrial uh, ABB uh, 120 robot. It allows us to do uh, that kind of experiment uh, with many uh, different things. It's, uh, I mean, not so original. I mean, it's uh, uh, quite basic. But the interesting element is the fact that uh, thanks to this uh, equipment, uh, one of my students, uh, I believe, uh, really an amazingly talented student, uh, whose name is Thibaut Schwartz, uh, developed a complete uh, plugin for Grasshopper which allows us to interact with the robot uh, uh, with, uh, I mean, with a much better ergonomy because Grasshopper is directly writing uh, the rapid code which is uh, 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 the standard lang language for <laughs> ABB robots. Uh, and you can change the tool, you can do 
uh, whatever uh, uh, you want, it, it's kind of easy and it's completely, completely integrated. And as you can see on the right, uh, it directly generates the code uh, for the robot. Then you just do copy paste and the robot does uh, what you have on, on the screen, uh, which, is, which is here, by the way. Uh, so, and my interest at the moment, thanks to, to this robot, it's not to address, let's say, different kind of geometry. Uh, on a personal level, I just focus on one kind of geometry, which uh, is called actually the digital geometry. Digital geometry is a small part of discrete geometry, which itself, of course, I is a small part of geometry as a whole, which is an amazingly complex field of mathematics. Uh, but I'm interested in, in the definition of this kind of surfaces, of this kind of discrete surfaces. So what does it mean for architecture? Uh, what I mean, what does uh, the notion of continuity mean? What is a discrete curvature, for example, which is an interesting uh, concept? Uh, how many different con configuration uh, we, 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 we have to deal with, uh, uh, with this geometry, what are the axioms of this geometry, what are the definitions, and what can we do with that? And as you can see here uh, on the right, this is a discrete line, and the interesting thing is that if you, if you have a clear definition of what a discrete line is, then you can ask a cellular automata to automatically draw a discrete line. So in fact, it's not about, for example, using cellular automata to have, let's say, growing patterns, which, which are more or less random or more or less related to uh, uh, some sort of agent-based uh, uh, behavior, more or less complex, but it's really trying to, uh, uh, to relate, let's say, the intrinsic rationality of the discrete geometry and I still believe that in architecture we need a clear definition of what is a straight line, what is a plane, <laughs> uh, what is a, 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 I mean, either it is an horizontal plane or uh, an inclined, inclined plane, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I, I, regarding that, I, I can, I might sound very traditional, but in fact, I don't see any kind of architecture which ultimately does not become traditional because it has to be built. So in order to be built, we have to understand the physical nature of it. And this physical nature is related to the mathematical or to the geometrical nature of this architecture as well. And one of the problems we are dealing with at the moment in the field of architecture is that we design very complex structure, but ultimately we have to deal with an amazing number of approximations at each level of the design and of the building process, in fact. And this idea of approximation is very problematic. For example, when you have a curved or a double curved surface, there's no other way than doing approximations if you want to build it. I mean, you just, I mean, this concept of approximation is, is always present. While, while, in fact, if you just, let's say, if you just change your geometrical paradigm, it, if you don't use continuous geometry anymore, but if you go into discrete geometry and more precisely into digital geometry, then you just deal with integer number, integer, you don't deal with real numbers, you don't deal with a metric, you don't deal with a traditional metric, but you just define everything in a voxel space, exactly like on the screen of your computer. I mean, you don't speak about the length in centimeter. You speak, you speak about the re resolution of the screen as a number of pixels, actually. And in fact, I, I believe that this is probably something we have to deal with in the field of architecture, especially because architecture is more and more related to, to, to robotic fabrication. And robots intrinsically deal with discrete elements. I mean, if you take a look just as uh, the official names of most of the robotic company in the world, I mean, the, the name, for example, for the ABB company in Paris, it's Discrete Automation Company. I mean, in, and in fact, this discrete, this idea of the uh, uh, discrete is very, very important at the moment. 
So I'm just trying to, uh, uh, to develop uh, here are uh, 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 examples of self-interlocking uh, cubic element. So uh, in fact, you have a couple of configuration and when, when you put the elements, they uh, block uh, one to, uh, I mean, they create a stable geometrical configuration. And I'm trying to see how we can use different materials, mainly uh, 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 concrete, uh, not traditional concrete, but highly, very amazingly liquid concrete, like water, in order to adapt itself to this kind of geometry. So in fact, it means that uh, we are always into this uh, cohabitation or into this dialogue between continuous element, because for example, the concrete works only as a continuous material, and discrete a discrete based architecture because uh, the internal logic of robots and, and, and robotic fabrication is discrete. So here are a couple of examples of what we can uh, uh, obtain as structures actually for the internal uh, concrete stuff. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. I think we probably have time for a couple of questions. Is there any questions from the audience? Because I'm sure we're going to have a very lively debate about isms <laughs> over the next year for sure. Is there anything from the audience? Wonderful lecture, thanks Thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it, enjoy the work. Um, so a question about the moment that you transition from the digital to the physical, and I think the example with the random number generator is an interesting one, that the digital relies on the physical world in order to produce random. Even though it's supposedly universal, it can't compute that. So it's an interesting question because the moment that you go back to the physical through the robot or through any material, you end up with tolerances and all of that stuff. And even in my own work, I, I deal with similar questions. So what's your perspective on how to stay in discrete or digital realms in the physical? Yeah, uh, actually, you're, you're, you're right to, to address this question because we don't deal with, we, we don't deal with uh, uh, even if on the computer we deal with this discrete geometry or with this digital geometry. And even if we try to approach this as, uh, 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 as precisely as we can with the robot, that's why the robots are becoming more and more precise, actually. I mean, more or less at the moment, the, the what is called the, the repetition precision of an industrial robot is uh, uh, 0 0.02 millimeters or something. Even if we, I, if we manage to use that kind of tool, we have to deal with these tolerances, actually. And it's, I believe that there's no, let's say, there's no theoretical answer to it. It's just, it's just empirical. Uh, we, we, we have very strong difficulties in order to assemble, actually, this uh, uh, element. For example, we moved uh, uh, we moved from mechanical assembling to uh, gluing, uh, and in fact, we know uh, now that gluing, uh, in many cases, can be even much stronger than any kind of mechanical assembling. Uh, some cars in Germany at the moment, uh, the the bodies of the cars are just glued. <coughs> actually, they are not they are not welded uh, uh, or sold solded welded. Uh, anymore. They, I mean, they are just glued, actually. So, uh, in fact, it's about, let's say, trying to reduce as much as we can a, any kind of mechanical element. It's, there is a very strong opposition, which is, which is almost an opposition of, uh, it, it goes back to this example of the Olivetti typing machine. In fact, there is, a, there is an intrinsic opposition between precision and, me and mechanism, and, and I mean physical 
mechanism. So that's why we have to reduce the amount of mechanism as much as, much as we can, which is a, a difficult problem because, because our architecture is ultimately physical and by being physical, it's based on that. So, I, I mean, one, yeah, one, one of the uh, 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 solution we 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 used recently was just like the one I I evoked. I mean, we we were a bit too idealistic regarding the fact that we can use very precise mechanical elements. So in fact, instead of trying to make this mechanical element more and more precise, we said, but why not removing the idea of a mechanical element itself in order to favor a completely different, or, or not completely, but a different methodologies. And that's one of the options, I believe. I mean, Moving from assembling to gluing, for example, is one of the answer to the problem. But it's, it doesn't mean that it works for everything. Yeah, well, uh, thank you again for yet another uh, beautiful lecture. But uh, I have a, a similar question in terms of, I mean, it seems like at least in, in this presentation, you're not really taking a, a into account noise too much, or even your example of vernacular architecture obviously works with friction, for instance, because of the level of noise in the elements. They are imperfect. Uh, and, and for instance, someone like David Deutsch uh, uh, also connects this idea of limits of computation to the limits of physics in some ways. Mm -hmm. It always follows this quantum computation, etc. So it seems like these models are based on binary logics, more or less, of computing. Yes. So what's your comment on that? Because if you are to engage matter, I, I think ignoring the idea of noise or, and even, even if I think of, okay, gluing as an example, how do you then address something like adaptation or transformation, for instance, as, as one uh, domain that one might need in architecture? Yes. Uh, actually, I, I, yeah, I agree. For example, if you glue, the whole idea of transformation collapse, actually. You can do nothing. Uh, but still, it doesn't mean that, uh, that the idea of transformation doesn't hold anymore for, ev I mean, for everything, you see. I mean, in any case, um, in traditional architecture, even if it's not welded, even if it's just assembled with screws or things like that, even if on a theoretical level you would perfectly be able to disassemble it and to reassemble it in, in another way, nobody is doing it because the economical rationality of it doesn't, doesn't fit, you see? So I don't think it's just a matter of uh, if it's possible or not. It's, I would say it's more a matter of does it hold economically or not? If, if the idea of transformation is of no interest on an economical level, then let's, let's not spend some time with this idea as, as, as a theoretical problem in architecture. You see what I mean? Yes. It works with high, mathematically, it works with high level of noise mm -hmm. as a collapsing force rather than this uh, uh, perfection of binary noise. But this is, and of course, you said this support this big logic, but I don't think it's the sole answer. Uh, That's the yes, it's, it's not. It's not <laughs> Let's say it's not the, the whole answer, and I, I wouldn't say it's an ultimate model. It's also not an ultimate model. I would mainly define it as a step. I mean, saying that we should probably address the issue of construction not based on elements which are always changing in shape, dimension, which are still based on a traditional understanding of what is an element. You see, that's what I mean. I mean, even an, an element which is, which is laser cut or something like that, like, a, I mean, a beam, a, a, a pile, and, and I mean, those elements are, okay, they are 
they are more precise, they are uh, fabricated with different techniques which didn't exist 50 years ago, but, the, but conceptually speaking, they are the same. I mean, a beam that you are using in... Tr in Yes. Maybe that's why I'm saying that that in fact in that kind of model, for example, we always deal with uh, the discrete nature of the elementary uh, cubes. I mean. Uh, and the fact that the uh, concrete, which is inside, the concrete is continuous because the concrete works in a continuous way. I mean, as a structure, you cannot have disconnected concrete structures or not disconnected, but let's say discrete one. It doesn't work. It should be, it should be based on a continuity that the whole idea of that, so we are always dealing with those, this, with those two, uh, two things actually. Uh, Philip. Yes, uh, actually, actually, I, the three D printing is probably the only technique at the moment which is truly revolutionary. I, I completely agree on that. The only problem is that. Uh, First, we don't have amazingly big 3D printing yet at the moment, which are perfectly operational. Uh, we don't have those machines which are dealing with uh, very different materials. We have those machines with different materials, di different densities of materials in 3D printing, but on a small, on a small level, not on a, on a, on a very uh, big scale. And it's still very expensive in any case. And it doesn't mean, I mean, even 3D printing, when you think of it, you can also reduce it as a discrete series of, of dots, even infinitely yeah. s small, or, you see, or uh, you see what I mean. So it's not too antagonistic logic. You could perfectly do that in 3D printing. But 3D printing, then it would not be about having a continuous layer of material. It would be just very small square or cubic dots. So it's not, it's not comp two completely antagonistic um, models, I would say. Philippe, if, uh, if you would entertain my seed of uh, provocation, Solely because I think we're we're talking about uh, a certain kind of discussion, but I think maybe the things that were more provocative from your perspective was your kind of idea and uh, let's say intellectual crutch with regard to mathematics and sci science as being a kind of way of dealing with the world. And I only put this out there because I think there has to be a distinction between information, understanding, and knowledge, which seem to be critical forms of evaluation and understanding what computation would actually mean. And I'm saying that mostly at this age, uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where the questions of this, even from the point of view that, I mean, discussions that we have with Patrick and so forth, the questions about the nature of logic is just as much what you include in the system as much as what you exclude. So the definitions are very much based on a certain kind of attitude towards systemic practice, but even by those kind of seminal interrogators, in particular like Macy's conference and so forth, that was trying to position what these demands would mean relative to all positions. And architecture was not one of them. But it seems probably the most provocative to actually reinstate, I think, today, and I'm sure it's going to be a seat of a lot of conversation, was the fact that some of those seminal people that were trying to talk about the illusion of control in a certain sense. As much as they were sort of moving towards that trajectory, they were also suspicious of the limitations of it. And let's say maybe one of the sort of critical ways of addressing this, even in the models of, for example, Negroponte, that same model which I use in very much of the everyday discourse of my own sort of uh, model for sort of ascribing a desire for 
the realities of that particular model with uh, gerbils was that the gerbil in itself caused the system to behave in ways that were as much to deal with failure as it much as it had to do with computational control. And why I say that is like, for example, with your project, what I find very fascinating in your description of the chair project, you go through the process of a lot of iterations of the chair. And for sure, in that manner, I think is super critical. But let's say in parallel to those people in the 60s and 70s, you had conceptual artists like Kasuth, who in a very seminal piece had three chair project where he talked about the difference between the chair as a physical object, the photography of a chair as a representational reproduction of what chair means, and the definition of what chair means. The critical feature was that the idea of the chair or that conceptual framework was the only thing that binded all of these things together. And so the fact that the chair remains a chair will still always sort of operate it in the domain of knowledge known, not knowledge in sense that remains to be seen or is in the state of becoming. I put that out there from my own sort of personal perspective because as much as I admire the cybernetics and all of the other sort of aspects and systemics, I think the critical desire to sort of in investigate this is going to be part of the discussions that we're going to have. My only feeling is that the conversation at the elemental level is not necessarily where I find your project the most provocative. I, I find your initial discussion up till the idea of robotics, which for me personally is another form of mechanization. And if you look at Gideon's sort of ideas of the, let's say, the machines that are used in the meatpacking industry to, you know, mutilate, cut, and produce, that kind of processing of production is very different than its subscription to the modernist architect. So I find the, the discussion, I think, super fascinating. I think it's an amazing provocation and I think we will be continuing the conversation, obviously, with the uh, projects tomorrow. So because we actually have to run off very quickly, I would encourage everybody to join us tomorrow for round two, where we're <laughs> seeing six more projects. And I'm sure this conversation will be no, uh, as an important feature for that. Just one world, actually. Uh, one, one world. Uh, I, I agree with the fact that in fact, I'm mainly interested between the relationship between a state of knowledge of a certain period and what we do in the field of architecture. I mean, what comes from me is the state of knowledge, in fact. That's why the chair project, for example, was interesting. And to go back to, to this skepticism you are speaking about, in fact, if we didn't address this issue of construction through 3D printing at the very beginning, it's because we didn't want to have, a, let's say, a geometrical model that could only be based on a machine. Because when you have this stone construction, you can do it with a machine if you want, but you can also do it by hand. So it relates to a completely different idea of autonomy. So, in fact, I, I'm very much interested in this idea of having, l let's say, a sort of very elementary man, which is just body and knowledge. So, having the technique which is pushed, or the technology with which is pushed so much that it completely disappears. And, it, I mean, it's obviously one of the main, let's say, utopia of the uh, of many technological thinkers uh, i mean really highly developed technology means the disappearing of technology exactly like for politics for Mar marx actually a really advanced politics would mean ultimately a completely a complete disappearing of politics itself because it it would reach a state where it's not necessary anymore you see so that's, that's, why, that's why I didn't address it through 3D printing at the beginning, because I was more interested in into the, the, the nature of knowledge or the, or, or the geometrical model than into the technical apparatus that would be used. So the robot, let's say, it came after. I was first interested uh, in 
discrete geometry and digital geometry, and later on in machines. Okay. okay. <laughs> it will disappear, this piece. Yes, yes. Because it's, it's, it's normal that it's still there, but through the evolution it would disappear by itself. <laughs> let's put it this way. It'll be food for thought for our dinner <laughs> conversation. Anyway, please let's thank Philippe for the lecture. And